Hello and welcome. I'm Bradley Verdell. You're watching Authors Recommend Books. Back with me again today is poet and author Mark Will, who's now becoming an expert at doing online book recommendations. Um, today we're going to give you, as usual, a fiction recommendation and a non-fiction recommendation. Um, these are not paid advertisements. Uh, we're both authors, so we read a lot because it's a great way to enhance your craft. Um, and when we find books that we really like, we recommend them, uh, and then in the hopes that people who like our recommendations will give our books a shot. Um, Mark, what's a book that you've written that people can buy and enjoy? Love Letters and a Man A, available now in paperback on Amazon, soon to be available in the ebook format that's coming within the next week or two. Oh, brilliant. I didn't, yeah, I didn't even realize uh, that it wasn't an ebook already. I well, it was. there's an audiobook version. Oh, that's what no, I was No ebook version yet, but that's coming soon. Cool. And if you um, like some steampunk, some fantasy, if you're a fan of Indiana Jones or Lost World literature, you will probably enjoy my books, uh, which includes the Chadwick Yates series, which you can check out by following the links in the description, where you'll also find Of Letters and a Man A, uh, and basically all the books that we've written. Uh, great. Okay, let's get started. Uh, my recommendation today is a book called Woodcraft, and uh, this is by E.H. Kreps. And it was published in 1919. Uh, now, I read this like I read most of the nonfiction that I've been recommending um, for research purposes. I think it's very hard to write steampunk or what I... I I'm not really keen on the phrase steampunk. Like I, I, My books are technically, I guess, steampunk. I just don't like that particular word. So no. I, I think the punk makes it sound too modern mm. when it's... The other thing is that a lot of steampunk is kind of like, hmm, a little bit, well, I don't want to say bad things about what other people are doing, but I prefer to think of what I like to write as Victorian fantasy. No, it's, it's, you know, fantasy is basically written in medieval times, essentially, right? Like most traditional fantasy, sword and sorcery, it's castles and catapults and swords and bows and arrows and elves and dwarves. But basically, in terms of the technology level of the world, it's medieval. Right. Okay, maybe Roman, you know, empire, maybe, you know, just different things. But in my view, that's just been done to death. I, I think I like to move the timetable forward and write that kind of fantasy in a world that has more Steam modern engines. appurtenances. Yeah, yeah, so you have, you know, maybe the beginnings of electricity, but maybe, you know, telegrams and things like that. It allows you to pace things up because you have things as fast as, say, trains and, you know, things like that. Um, so it allows messages to travel and it just allows you more fun in the plot. But it's very hard to write Victorian fantasy or steampunk unless you're willing to do some research because you know, it's hard to write about a setting unless you've kind of done some due diligence on that setting. Uh, and this is a book that I think if people um, you know, like my books or they want to write in that <coughs> time period, um, it, it's extremely helpful to read uh, how people survived and thought about camping and woodcraft uh, back in the time period. Now, 1919 might seem pretty late for something like that, but a lot of these ideas don't really change uh, that much. Yeah. Um, so um, this is a great book to have on your shelf, and I'll give you uh, just three reasons why. Uh, the main one is that um, uh, Krebs, again, publishing this in 1919 after living in the woods for a long time before that. He was a hunter and a trapper and an outdoorsman. And um, he has, he's, give, he's giving explanations about things that maybe there weren't a lot of, you know, uh, books about camping. and There wasn't a lot of commercial sort of camping equipment um, at, the, at the time. So he's writing things that he thinks, you know, are, are lacking, that, that people uh, don't know the basics of. Um, so his section on food is really, really good, and it's something I've referred to again and again uh, when writing. He, he says things that, that should be considered kind of basic, but he walks the reader through it like you're, you're very much a beginner. He says, you know, your food has to be light in weight, 
small in bulk. It has to keep well um, in the cold. So you, you know, canned goods that are full of water will freeze and burst. So you can't be doing that. He's. I should say that he's mostly going camping in the northern extremes of the U.S. and southern Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it has to be nutritious. Has to give you all your nutrition so that you don't get scurvy and things like that. Um, it has to be balanced so that the food is not injurious. You have to be able to cook it on short order because you might come home at after dark, after being out all day, and all you've had is lunch, and you're starving, and things like that. He talks about how to build a cabin and the furniture you need for your cabin if you're going to be out for a long time. But one of the highlights of the book is he gives a he gives two lists of equipment that are incredibly specific. So he says this is for one man for one month in the woods, in the northern forests, basically. And he even tells you the exact weight. It should come out to uh, 87 and a half pounds to 89 and a half pounds. So you've got a sense if you're writing about characters who are traveling um, overland through the woods or they're going to be surviving um, away from civilization for a long time, you need some kind of idea of, okay, how much pack weight are we looking at on their horses or mules or whatever. Um, so he gives you that, and he, he gets very specific. And I won't go through the list, but it, you know that's why people should buy the book and read it. But, you know, things like, he tells you exactly, like, you know, six pounds of sugar per month, um, unless you're going to put it in your tea and coffee and then make it seven pounds. Uh, He goes in and he gives you varying options, depending on your preferences. He gives two good lists um, for that. So it's very helpful if you're writing, like my books have a lot of camping and survival and traveling through the woods in that time period, and, and they don't have, you know, modern ultralight backpacking, like I'm hiking the Appalachian Trail kind of gear, you know. Now you can get, we, we have so much more high-tech stuff. Um, so his, his lists are very, very helpful. Um, he has a section on um, making fire, how to handle matches, how to build fire for different occasions, how to... Um, Build a fire. Have you ever read um, any of Jack London's sure. works? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like people who like you know Jack London's like to to build a fire. We're talking about forty degrees below, and you know, and it, it could be life or death to start a fire. Really, this guy is writing about this kind of situation and tells okay. you, you know, uh, <clears throat> from a how-to perspective rather than a fiction. Uh, story perspective, like, okay, this is how you take care of your matches, and this is what, how to start a fire without match. He doesn't like the bow drill method and things like that. He says, you know, magnifying glass is good and things like that. And he has a lot of experience, so, it, you know, it sounds good. Um, the last thing I'll say is just that um, he, um, one gem that I pulled out of this book, and I've read so many survival books, modern and old, and, you know, I'm from Tennessee, so we have people like Horace Kephart and um, Nesmuk or George Sears, you know, all the sort of classic survival um, books. And I've read some modern survival books, like there's one by a guy called Davenport that's absolutely fantastic. But a gem that I pulled out of this book that I had never known about before, and this will be used in the Chadwick Gates series later on, I've been itching to use this for a long time, is that um, Krebs talks about a rabbit fur blanket that has almost magical properties. So again, think think of your Jack London to build a fire newbie guy in the Yukon doesn't realize how cold it is ends up freezing to death, right? This guy says that uh, the rabbit fur, fur blankets were made by the native peoples um, there. And it takes between 50 and 60 snowshoe rabbits to make one blanket. Hmm. And the weave of the blanket is so loose, you could poke your finger through and it will completely go through the other side. It's a very loosely woven blanket. But the fur is so poofy, it looks solid. Right. But if you press on it, it goes right through. Poofy is a good word. Yeah, it's a, my diction is just fantastic. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, he says, uh, you know, e- each rabbit, basically, there's a way of uh, skinning the the fur off the rabbit, getting the pelt off the rabbit, where you get a one-inch strip about ten feet long from one rabbit. Mm-hmm. And he, he even details how these are woven, but he says basically you just you just find uh, you know Native Americans uh, Nat- or Native Canadians or First Nations uh, people, and you just buy it from them. He says it's you know, really laborious to make. Um, 
but um, it will roll up, and again, his specifics are excellent, into um, a bundle that should be, what does he say? If you roll it up, it's going to be about 10 inches in diameter by 20 inches in length, and it should fit in the bottom of your pack. But it's going to weigh 8 pounds. So you've got all the dimensions. You've got the weight of the blanket, how, uh, you know, how big it is. And he says, basically, even if you don't have a fire, if you lay down on the snow with nothing else, and you wrap yourself like a taco in the blanket with only your nose sticking out, mm -hmm. you can sleep through the night warm and comfortable, even if it's 40 below. Hmm. That's how warm it is. And he uses that description, like yeah. a taco? Uh, no, he doesn't say like a taco, but it, it, it's something like, it's, you know, you enfold yourself in it, right? Because that's how you lay on a wool blanket as well. Like people who are familiar with kind of like cowboy camping where they had just like a wool blanket, um, there, there's like a method of rolling yourself up yeah, in it. Yeah, and there's yeah. YouTube videos about it. So, but a lot of people who are interested in, in bushcraft um, probably won't even have heard of this uh, snowshoe rabbit fur blanket. Mm -hmm. But he says that there's just nothing that beats it. He says, you know, you, you, it's, it's kind of heavy, but you can sleep throughout the entire night instead of waking up every hour and throwing more wood on the fire because right, if that fire right. goes out, you're going to die, right? <laughs> um, so I'm going to use this in a kind of high mountain, uh, snowy situation. And, and he says, you know, people will say, well, what if it rains? Say, when it's this cold, it doesn't rain. <laughs> you know, you're, you don't have to worry about sleeping on wet ground or anything. So if, if it's warm enough to rain, it's warm enough that a wool blanket will be fine. You don't mm -hmm. need a rabbit fur blanket if you're worried about rain. And then he even tells you the little kind of sensory details that I love to put in my uh, novels. Like he says, the one bad thing about it is that it sheds fur everywhere. And it'll get on your crackers. It'll get on your fingers when you're cooking. It'll get into your soup. It'll get in your pack. It'll get all over everything, you know. But, but that's, you know, the one downside. But I had never in all my reading of survival books, I never read about somebody just having a blanket, putting it down on the snow when it's sub-zero, getting inside, folding up, and being able to sleep all the night and be warm. And uh, one final point is just, uh, it's very interesting that he's so down on sleeping bags. He's writing in a time when people are just beginning to make manufactured like sleeping bags right. for camping out, and he's like, oh, they're terrible. You know, go with a, wood bl a wool blanket or um, one of these rabbit, rabbit skin blankets. Why? Um, what does he have against yeah, sleeping bags? He thinks they're just not very warm, and they're too um, they're too bulky, and when they get wet, they take forever to dry. Mm. And um, uh, I think, yeah, I mean, because one thing about wool is that it's really hard to catch on fire. So, like, if you're sleeping, you know, like some we don't really have this problem nowadays, but like, you know, sleeping bags that aren't made of something a little bit fireproof when you're sleeping right beside a a fire, you get all these little uh, singe marks or little like, right. holes made by ash. But um, he goes into all the details of different sleeping bags that he's tried and why he finds them inferior and, and no good. Um, but I think it's mainly the bulk because a wool blanket is quite light for its, uh, you know, it's it does a great duty for its uh, size and, yeah. and weight. Um, and he has a whole chapter. I'll just tease this out. Uh, he has a a, a chapter about the perfect axe and a lot of people who are into bushcraft nowadays um, they learn about hatchets and axes and they like to go out in the woods and, and you know do bushcraft and so if you want to get a you know trapper from 1919 who spent months and months at a time in the wilderness to tell you what the perfect axe is uh, and how to handle it you will absolutely love this book so fantastic uh, book should be on every steampunk author's shelf so it's strengthening reading it is strengthening reading for sure yeah and and it you know it gave me ideas you know that's the great thing is sometimes I I want to put something in a novel yeah and I go and research it yes. other times I'm just reading random history and I think that is brilliant I've never heard of that probably my readers have never heard of it I'm gonna put it in the novel it's so cool it has to go in the novel don't you find that even if you only extract that one detail yeah. that makes the reading experience worthwhile. Like Absolutely. You, you read the, I don't know how long it was, 100 page book, 150 pages. Something like that, it's pretty yeah. short. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, you, you learn many other uh, mm. 
fascinating things as well, but maybe you only use that one piece of information, yeah. but it's so important to, you know, the work that you're, you're doing. So yeah, th- that kind of strengthening reading is invaluable. That, that, you know, the kind of feedback that I get on the Chadwick Yates books is, you know, wow, it's, you know, got so much cool material stuff in it, you know, things that are not essential to the plot, right? but it's the setting, the atmosphere seems to really attract people to the novel. Because it's, it's authentic and yeah. it's based on the research that you've done. So And, and sometimes, like you said, I've read, you know, an entire book and um, doing research and I cut it to two sentences yeah and people don't realize that you know that's you know eight ten hours of my life that I spent researching just to make those two sentences stand out exactly. you know and, and I hope people you know will not uh, not get a, not be too angry if it takes me a little longer to publish the next in the series right. <laughs> sometimes I feel like oh, I need to get the next book out quickly but I'm putting so much into it that but anyway, yeah, I said my piece, so we'll get on to what's in the fiction department today. Well, as you know, I'm a completionist. Yeah. Uh, which means I read everything that's written by mm-hmm. authors that I consider canonical. canonical. Our, our, There's a trend here. Yeah, our terminology. <laughs> so uh, today I will discuss a book by one of my favorite canonical Writers. This is the Japanese author Mishima Yukio, or Yukio Mishima, as he's called in English. Right. Um, and uh, he, a lot of his stuff can be considered transgressive literature, which we've talked about yes. before. Uh, he writes about murder, for example, and the sailor who fell from grace with the sea, sexual deviance, mm. and pretty much everything, but. Uh, most famously his book Forbidden Colors, uh, Arson, uh, The Temple of the Golden Pavilion, Suicide, mm. uh, that's a common theme. Uh, in particular, what's that? Is it a student? A student. Yeah, who commits suicide in the story? No, uh, it's a disgruntled uh, Japanese military officer. Oh. Uh, this is in the story Patriotism. And... Uh, mm. I don't, I don't, do you know Mishima? Have you heard no, of him? No, Okay, well, uh, he actually uh, himself committed ritual suicide, seppuku. Wow. Like the day he finished the fourth novel in the tetralogy that I'm going to talk about today. Yeah. He finished writing the novel in the morning, and then he went and committed ritual suicide later that day. Wow. So, so the he four... He didn't even wait for it to be published. Just finished writing. I mean, the other three volumes had had been published. He finished the fourth that very day. I mean, you'll see it like the date at the the end of the fourth novel in the tetralogy is the same date that he committed suicide. And yeah, it's it's quite a story. It was a big. uh, It was something of a media production because he he staged a a sort of coup like uh, that's a long story but he he uh, led this paramilitary group and he tried to like take a a Japanese uh, military high ranking Japanese military officer hostage and he had all these crazy demands and uh, the uh, plot sort of fell apart and so uh, you know, rather than suffer the disgrace of imprisonment or whatever. Actually, it was already planned in advance that he was going to do this, but he committed seppuku, ritual suicide, there in that military barracks. When? This sounds like it was... 1975, I want to say. That's pretty modern for a seppuku. Yeah, well, I'll I'll, uh, I'll discuss that because one of his... One of his great themes is the conflict between traditional Japanese samurai culture and mm-hmm. modernism. Okay. Okay. So anyway, uh, these are some of his themes. They're very, uh, well, some of them are transgressive. They're, they're heavy, dark, uh, you know, sometimes disturbing themes. But uh, he's, he's an amazing, an amazing writer. Uh, I think in the last episode, I discussed 
uh, William S. Burroughs, you know, yes. the, the guy the who, lands, right? the Western lands, and, uh, you know, he was, he was a heroin addict, and uh, he uh, accidentally, or maybe not accidentally, killed his right. wife, so uh, Mishima, too, is another one of these authors that, uh, you know, one can be in awe of even if one doesn't necessarily uh, approve of all of the author's personal decisions yeah, and, and right. actions. I mean, in particular, Mishimu was was a right-wing Japanese nationalist. Mm-hmm. I mean, some people consider him a fascist, and some of his, yeah. you know, some of his... Uh, uh, Essays and his public pronouncements could be interpreted that way. So, well, I think, I mean, just to <clears throat> jump in, I mean, I think anybody who's into steampunk or the Victorian era, you, you just have to get used to that, you know. I mean, and in fact, actually, we were just talking about Jack London. I mean, to some people, the only thing they think about Jack London is what a vile racist, you know, they think, you know, their, their view of London is purely, you know, his personal kind of, um, views on on you know uh, social things but you know you can like you said you can still stand in awe of somebody's work their their fiction their writing and say well you know maybe i don't really approve of all their life decisions or whatever but i mean right. you know, especially if you're going to look if you're going to read steampunk or go back to the victorian era you you kind of get used to saying wow this person's awesome except for this <laughs> you know? right right so that's well in the case of jack london he was also uh well, <clears throat> I think at some point I will discuss his anti-fascist novel, The Iron Heel. Mm. Uh, so we could do that one together. Yeah. That'd be interesting. Okay. To do a book that well, we maybe read. maybe yeah. we should. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, when preparing my notes for this, I was reminded of Baudelaire's uh, warning not to confuse ink with virtue, That's right. or virtue with ink. So uh, you know. I consider Mishima one of my literary masters, but uh, politically we <laughs> we don't <laughs> yeah. we don't necessarily agree. But uh, yeah, so I'm a completionist. I I believe I've now read everything by Mishima which is available in English. There's uh-huh. one there's one collection of plays uh, that I have at home that I've I've not finished. But other than that. Uh, I've read everything that is in English that I know of, so I'm a pretty devoted student of of this author. And so today I'm talking about what is uh, generally considered his masterpiece. Some people would disagree, but the Sea of Fertility Tetralogy, these four novels, uh, the last of which was completed the day he committed ritual suicide. Uh, and today, I will talk about book one, Spring Snow. Okay. Uh, although my favorite is probably book two, Runaway Horses, which deals with some young men that are attracted to these uh, ancient samurai ideals, and they mm-hmm. sort of become right-wing fanatical uh, Japanese nationalists. and. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, in some ways, it, it parallels, uh, you know, Mishima's own activities. But the way he he uh, tells the story of these young men is just it's masterful. But anyway, that's we're not talking about that. We're talking about spring snow. But I'll just say that uh, if you're if you're interested in modern Japan at all, uh, the Sea of Fertility tetralogy is. Must read. The, the, yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's the epic of 20th century Japan. Uh, so Spring Snow in particular uh, concerns itself with the doomed love affair between Kiyoaki Matsugai, that's the young man, and uh, a young lady named uh, Satoko Ayakura. Uh, their families... And they're, you know, well-to-do, aristocratic uh, families of modern Japan. Mm -hmm. Uh, And 
the families have known each other for many years, but uh, the the two children, uh, you know, develop a romantic interest in one another, and it it deals with with the uh, with this relationship, and I'll just say it doesn't end well. Mm. I won't I won't. Uh, Explain why. Yeah, because that could mean anything. It doesn't end well. Could be. No spoilers. <laughs> <clears throat> That's our rule here. Uh, but uh, we find out later, uh, as as we read the other three books in the tetralogy, really the central character is Kiyo- Kiyoaki's friend, Shigekuni Honda, who appears in all four books. So in the beginning... Honda is a a young man, basically a teenager, and by the time you get to volume four, which is called The Decay of the Angel, uh, he's an old man. So it's it's the story of his life and his relationship to his friend Kiyoaki, who uh, remains important to him throughout life because... Uh, he meets other people in the other three volumes and he believes rightly or wrongly that they are somehow reincarnated forms of his friend Kiyoaki. Wow, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. And that's one of the other important themes of the tetralogy. Uh reincarnation and karma, uh Buddhism, uh mm-hmm. you know in in particular Zen Buddhism, uh uh, but also other forms of Buddhism, uh, especially in uh, Volume 3. Uh, Honda goes to India and really uh, looks for the, the roots of the, the doctrine, you know, the Hindu doctrine of reincarnation and karma. But uh, other themes include the conflict between Eros and Thanatos, you know, sex and death. Yeah. That's that's always in Mishima. Uh, I, I talked before about the conflict between traditional Japanese culture, in particular samurai culture, and and modernism, uh, and then of course you know family, and in particular the Japanese family. But uh, it's uh, if you've never read any any Mishima, I don't know that I would start with with this book, uh, but. You may as well because once you once you uh, start reading him, I think you'll probably become a completionist like me and want to read want to read everything. But I guess in the in the Sea of Fertility tetralogy, uh, I was often reminded it's like a a Japanese version of Dostoevsky and Proust. So wow. you've got like the dark some of the dark themes of Dostoevsky. And, and the psychological insights of Dostoevsky, but then you've got like the the uh, deep philosophical meditations and the the uh, I guess social chronicling of a particular time, like what you would find in Proust. So mm-hmm. you know, obviously not a chronic a chronicling of of French uh, society at a particular time, but uh, Japanese society and culture in the in the uh, you know twentieth century. It begins uh, in the uh, in the early part of the twentieth century. I want to say it's like nineteen ten around there. And <clears throat> in, in vol by volume four, we're basically up to the present time. You know, like early seventies. Uh, and and so uh, yeah, highly recommended. The, the tetralogy, all four books are a must read. Uh, I don't even know if you can use the star system. I mean, <laughs> it's off it, the it's yeah, off the maybe charts. maybe more than five stars. It's yeah. just uh, <clears throat> to me, it's essential reading. I'm well, saying it's like a Japanese Dostoevsky is like. That's really selling this book. That's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty high really praise. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, even even if one doesn't uh, agree with with some of uh, Mishima's views, uh, he's a 
he was a fascinating person and uh, he's a brilliant, brilliant writer. Wow. High praise. Have you ever been to Japan, by the way? Oh, m- multiple times. Yeah. Probably four times. Yeah. I, that was the first foreign country I ever visited. When okay. I left the States. I, I was, went to Japan and I was a, a homestay student. I actually lived right. with a Japanese family. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, th- there will always be a special place in my heart for Japan. I mean, every time I go there, I just, you know, it's a beautiful culture. If we right. have any Japanese people um, watching the video, you guys are awesome. <laughs> and uh, have a really special place in my heart for, for Japan. I was obsessed with Japan when I was younger, and then when I got to go there, it was oh, it, was, it was a formative experience. It was great. Um, all right. Anything else? We good? I think okay. we're good. All right. Um, I really wish you had pronounced all the Japanese names with, like, a really strong Texas accent and, like, no regard for Japanese. Mishima. <laughs> yeah. Mishima. Right. <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, um, thanks again for watching. And, you know, the last couple of videos, I forgot my catchphrase. i got to bring my catchphrase oh. back. Please subscribe to our channel. Like the videos and share them with all your friends and all your enemies. He did it. <laughs>